we get one of them, so let's make it a great one. My name is Dave. This is Steve Edwards. And Steve, what are we going to do for the next 30 minutes? Oh, by golly, we're going to talk mules and donkeys. We definitely uh, want to answer questions. I uh, want to talk about the evil spur. Ooh, what you got yeah. right there? That's a Halloween sticking yeah. around. Yeah, watch out for the evil spur. Yeah, I, I get a kick out of people. They tell me they don't want to make the mule mad. You know, so so now the mule made them glad. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into that, folks. We are going to talk about mules and donkeys and the evil spur for the next 60 minutes. And we're so glad that you're here hanging out. Um, again, I'm Dave. This is Steve. Uh, and uh, really, there's only a few things that you need to know if this is your first time ever hanging out with us. Uh, thing number one is uh, we want to know that you're watching. So put your name, put where you're watching from in the comment section, uh, and we want to say hi to you. We want to know that you're here. Steve and I love hanging out. Matter of fact, I was out on his ranch, um, let's see, last week and had a good time, ate some food on the back porch, uh, yep. did some new videos on some saddles. Y'all are going to enjoy that. We're actually working, uh, the gentleman working right across from me is going to be putting those videos together, is in the process actually, and so we'll have them for you. Uh, but we're here to talk with you. So put your name and where you're watching from in the comment section. We want to say hi to you. The second thing that we ask is that you put your questions in the comment section. It's 100% about answering your questions, making sure you get the information you need so you can get out there and you can begin training and communicating effectively with your animals. So that's the second thing. The third thing, and this is really the only quote unquote payment that we ask for is that you just share the broadcast. Uh, we do this free every single week, but we love getting new folks coming in uh, and uh, discovering what we're doing here at Queen Valley Mule Ranch uh, every single week. So uh, with that, Steve, I say we get in and start uh, welcoming everybody. What do you say? Hey, awesome. Sounds good to me. I've already been texting Dave there, David in a place called Australia. Austra Australia. Yeah. Australia. Australia. Uh, let's see. Donnell is here from Oklahoma. Uh, Kathy is here again from Cotati, California. Kathy seems to be here week after week after week. Kathy, we are so grateful that you choose to spend some of your time here with us. Thank you so much. Uh, it means the world to us. And I'm hopping over on YouTube here. Let's see who is hanging up with us over on YouTube. We've got, says we got three folks watching right now. We've got Denise watching. We've got Amber says, hola, amigo. Amber here. Thanks for all the great mule tech. Uh, Denise is watching from Apple Valley, California. So we are going to get into boots and spurs here in a little bit. But uh, the first question we're going to go with, uh, this is talking about the difference between male and female mules. So uh, James sent a message in. He says, we love you, Steve. Oh, isn't that nice? We love hearing that. He says, your emails and videos are shared in the house. My two boys, 5 and 11, and my wife, the horse person that has now developed appreciation for mules and donkeys, we all love you. You are our teacher. We have learned a lot from you. Wow. The, stroking the ego there, Steve. Your head's going to get too big. Let me make my yeah. hat bigger here. Yeah. Make that hat size yeah. a little bit larger. Yeah. Uh, he says, request. I am looking for a 14 to 14.5 finished beginner safe mule or donkey that can carry at least 200 pound person. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're a family of four. My boys, my two boys are five and 11. We have a horse, a donkey and live in Chino Valley. We all watch your YouTube videos and read out loud. Uh, we are your groupies. I wanted to know, is there a difference between the temperament between a male and female mule? That's the question. So lots of good comments there. Thank you, James. The question is, is there a difference between the temperament of a male and a female mule? No. No, I, I haven't seen two nickels worth of difference from one to the other. Uh, my, uh, my grandson and I, back when he was about five years old and he's coming up on 18 now, we were in uh, uh, Walmart and looking for some stuff for my wife. And I had him up in the basket up in the front. And we were playing grandpa and grandkid stuff, you know, and giggling and laughing. Come around the corner, and uh, all of a sudden, he started philosophizing. Now, those kids are homeschooled, so this is not nothing for them. So there was two teenagers and a mom up in front of me. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, my grandson at five years old said, Grandpa, boys have penises, girls have vaginas. 
<laughs> exactly what you were counting on hearing that afternoon. Oh, I wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we might as well talk about this as long as we're all trying to talk. I hope my granddaughter's not listening too much. Anyway, so you know, maybe she needs to learn. Anyway, uh, here's the thing, folks. Uh, there is not a nickel's worth of difference. It's disposition, disposition, disposition. I have seen some John Mules with awesome dispositions, and others of them, they, uh, they didn't have a long life. Uh, and then I've seen the same thing with Molly Mules, folks. It's disposition, disposition. We, we do have, uh, uh, at times, a Molly, you know, when she comes into her cycles uh, time, uh, for, for an odd time, they're usually a little bit silly, but usually all the Molly Mules I've ever had, I hardly knew they were in cycle, you know. Um, so that's the main thing. There's not a difference, nickels worth of difference. You know, it's, it's a lot of people say this, that, and the other, but as many as I train, no. All right, now let's go back to this kid say 14 2 mule that 10,222 people are looking for. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm sorry to tell you, my, my friend, uh, and, and, uh, and this sort of thing, but they don't exist. Um, the, the animal is as good as you are. The people who try to sell you a kid safe meal, you need to stay away from them uh, because uh, I've seen some some uh, uh, 10-year-old girls outride some 25-year-old guys because they're good. Uh, but at the same time, they don't completely know what they're doing, but they're able to stay in the saddle. Look, if you can take and ride a mule or a donkey in a 10-foot circle, and what I mean by that, one-handed, you can side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hind quarters, get on and off safely, pick up all four feet uh, within a 10-foot circle, and, and they back up nice and easy, and they stop nice and easy, again, with a 10-foot circle, then I tell myself they have a good disposition, okay? I tell myself on top of that, they have good training. Now, it don't matter how many miles they've been up the trail. They're, how come everybody only, only tells you about the good miles and not the time where you hit the ground and got, right. the, got busted up? Right. Now, you know, uh, I've got a very good friend in a hospital right now, unfortunately. I just found out about it this morning. And he is the head of the uh, Mustang and, and Donkey program there at the, uh, uh, at the, at the prison. And uh, doggone it, he's, he's busted up real bad. I mean, well, he went to climb on the horse, uh, and and this is a horse they've been training on for quite a while. He went to climb on the horse. The, the horse went to buck him. He got underneath the horse. He got a broken sternum. He got a broken wrist. He got some broken ribs. He got a broken leg. <laughs> and uh, they had to fly him out. And, and, and folks, here is a cowboy, cowboy's cowboy. I mean, this guy flat knows how to ride. But the day is going to come, folks. Uh, don't ever think that you're not going to get hurt. These animals are animals, period. They put a bumper on the front of your car for when you make a mistake and on the back when somebody else makes a mistake. Uh, but these, these animals are not mistake-proof. I had a guy tell me today he was going to take his mule over to some place to do some bomb-proofing. And I said, uh, what, what bomb are you going to have go off? You know, ridiculous. No such thing as they can as they're bomb proof and fixed up. So there's a long story right there, you know. But thank you very much for all the patent on the back. Chino Valley's awesome. I've got a lot of friends there uh, uh, that, that that are really you know a cowboy pretty much all their life. But all right, well, what's next there? Very good. Well, we got some more people hanging out with us. Haley Williams is watching. Hey, Steve, just me here tonight. Oh, uh, Mark Williams is watching. Oh, Mark Williams is working, she says. Hey, Steve, just me here tonight. Mark Williams is working. Haley, we're glad that you're here. A little bit earlier for you today since we switched time zones. Uh, Arizona never switches the time zone. We always stay the same, almost all of Arizona. And so I think everybody else kind of like rolled their clock forward, and we just kind of hung out right where we were. Uh, But it's good to have you watching, Haley. Uh, Rebecca is watching, says, hey, Steve and Dave, watching from North Carolina. Love these sessions. Thank you. It's good to hear from you, Rebecca. Glad that you're here. Uh, Chris Davidson. (laughs) 
Mesa, Arizona, I would like to get your ideas on how to get Millie to quit pawing the dirt at the front of her enclosure. We have put several five-foot sections of 12-inch diameter irrigation ditch uh, culvert across the shallow hole she has dug, but she just paws behind it. She has a huge pen and friends on either side. She is calm and wonderful on our rides. The main problem with the pawing is we are pretty sure this is how she keeps pulling her front shoes off. So what do we have to say there? For Chris. All right, Chris. Um, I, by the way, I, I know the mule well. I've punched cows on it. I've trained on it. Uh, Chris, that was a that was a present from Chris to Chris. Uh, she had she had the cancer, and they beat the cancer, and so she bought herself a mule hmm. as a as a little gift to herself. Anyway, uh, all right, folks. The, the mule's paw, donkey's paw, horses too, because they want something. They want to be somewhere. Or they, they're pawing the ice to break the water to get a drink. Or they're pawing the snow off the grass to get a bite to eat. Or in this case here, they're pawing because she wants to do something else. All right. Can you fix it? Yes. Uh, is it a permanent fix? No. Here's what you do. You take the leather buckle and you put it above the knee with a 10 foot, uh, with about uh, 10 inches of heavy, heavy chain. Okay. And then you do the same thing on the other leg, a strap above the knee, about 10 inches of heavy chain that's attached to the strap hanging down. And then you take a baling twine and you go from strap over top of the neck to the other strap. And then when she paws, she paws and that makes her uncomfortable. Now, here's the thing. She will start learning at that spot. She can't paw. Otherwise, she's going to get the chains on her. You do not leave the chains on all the time. You only leave the chains on for a few minutes when you see her quit pawing. Come in. Good for you, Millie. Give her a few scratches. Take the chains off and put them away. Go back and watch again. But she's basically, is she pawing right next to the gate? Uh, that'd be good to know. But she's basically just wanting out, uh, wanting to do something. And and she she's... Um, she is pulling her shoes off because of those culverts. You're exactly correct. Uh, the only thing I would do is I would take a rubber mat like you have inside your trailers, and I would put it in the area where she paws. All right. There we go. Uh, the rubber mats, I actually know you've got them there at the ranch uh, right there by the hitching post, and uh, we've had some clinics there where you know, folks will see the mule paw, and they really don't get too <laughs> – they don't get too far because those rubber mats, they, they just hold up. Yep, they do. And, and we've got some pictures, some video mm -hmm. of me putting some chains on and some places. So uh, maybe we can find those and send them so Millie can get an idea what those are like. And I'll see if I can find them on YouTube. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate uh, that question. Uh, Linda says, whoa, y'all don't change times, do you? Howdy from Theo, the Red Mule, and Linda, the Mule Servant from Ch Chile, rural Ohio. It's good yeah. to see you, Lindy, Linda, uh, you and Theo. Thank you so much uh, for hanging out with us. We got a question that came in on YouTube, uh, and this was coming from last week's broadcast. Ethan hopped on a little bit late uh, after we had gotten done, watched the replay, and said, Steve, being from Kentucky, riding gated stock is the only option ever uh, since I've begun watching your videos. I've wondered if your saddle would work for a gated mule. Oh, absolutely. It, you know, my, the main thing you want on any mule is shoulder relief, absolute shoulder relief. And if you're riding a gated horse saddle on there, I, I, you're not going to believe what you're doing to that poor mule, but that's another story. Uh, uh, my mules, uh, two of my favorite mules, one was a Tennessee Walker and, uh, and uh, then we had the other one, Freebie. Uh, she was a foxtrotter, and she is currently over in Hawaii. But, oh, yeah, they, I've got a lot of people with uh, gated mules that have my saddle, so they'll work just fine. Very good. Glad to hear that. All right, let's see here. Uh, we've got Jim Morgan watching from Alabama. Says, greetings, Jim. It's good to have you here. Thanks so much for saying hi. And, folks, if you haven't said hi yet but you're watching, go ahead, put your name and where you're watching from in the comment section. I uh, want to know that you're here. We got James Perkins watching from uh, Holden, Montana. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then uh, let's get to our next question here. The next question, this one comes in from uh, Nicole. says, hi, Dave. 
My John started behaving in a way that baffles me. Let's see if we can figure it out. Every time I go out to give attention to my Jack, my little John keeps getting in between my Jack and I and then tries to run my Jack off by pinning his ears and turning around to kick him. Why is he doing this? It's definitely not something he's doing to me, but he's doing it to my Jack. Should I be concerned about it? Is this a leadership thing, Steve? Yes, absolutely leadership. It's, it's very normal for that John to think that the Jack is trying to take her over as his herd. And she needs to uh, not have them. Number one, folks, if you want to get yourself hurt, have a bunch of animals around you at one time. Uh, it's the easiest way I know to get stomped and bit and kicked because they, they're trying to bite or kick one another to get to you, and it can be tough. I always, always, always going to tell you, keep your mules and donkeys in a separate pen. And especially if you've got a little jack, if your uh, donkey is a little jack and he's not gelded yet, oh, he can be a terror and he can sure hurt one. They can sure hurt one another. So can they hurt each other? Yeah. Be prepared for some vet bills if you keep them together. Yep. Very good. All right. Let's see here. Next question we got. Uh, this one comes from Paul and this one's about shoeing. says, Last week on the internet, you talked about doing your own farrier work. I've trimmed my horses in the past. Do you have any good resources about trimming and shoeing mules and donkeys? If not, do you know of any out there? So number one, we've got the DVD. And we'll refer yeah. Paul to that DVD, the basics of shoeing uh, mules and donkeys. Uh, but is there anything else that you would – that would be just helpful for someone who's looking to start doing their own trimming, looking to start doing some of their own farrier work, assuming that – the mule's foot is in okay shape. Last week we talked about, hey, man, if there's a lot of correction that needs to be done, it's going to be hard for the novice. But if it's just basic shoeing and trimming, that's a lot easier. So let's talk about the basic shoeing and trimming. Is there anything that you would tell Paul uh, or anybody else who's looking to kind of start doing their own about, hey, here's what you want to consider? Well, you want to consider having good tools, number one. You know, your, your nippers – uh, and your, your rasp are the two number one things that you want that have to be top quality equipment. And, and, then, uh, and then your rasp, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to spend an average of 30 bucks for a good rasp because it really makes it last a long time and this sort of thing. And there's, there's lots of good stuff on the, on the YouTube. Uh, I don't know that there's that much on somebody necessarily doing a mule but you can get some ideas. The biggest thing, folks, when it comes down to this, uh, this shoeing is balance. And, and, and folks, I have seen a lot of shoers that are professional farriers, that are professional shoers uh, that, uh, that don't have a balanced foot. So you can be a non-professional and do a really good job. And I've seen a lot of people do that. But balance. So the flattest, straightest you can get it, the better. Okay. Um, so uh, you said I, – I had a follow-up question. You said it, and I just forgot it. I'm too young for that, Steve. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm You're too young to be started. forgetting yeah. something right there in the split second. Although I'll tell you what, having those three little ones running around – uh, let's put a little bit more gray or, or wisdom, wisdom on the yes. sides here, I should say, put a little bit more wisdom on the side and has caused me to be a little bit more forgetful than I've become accustomed to. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see, uh, a couple more folks. We've got Karen from Raymond, California watching. Uh, we've got John watching from San Luis Valley, Colorado. And then Linda has a question. She says, if you have a mule or donkey that has not been taught to stand tied, what is the best way to teach that? Horse people have told me to just tie them to the post with a sturdy halter and let them go nuts until they wear themselves out. But that seems both dangerous and cruel. What is the right way? Well, uh, number one, on my hitching rail, which is roughly about 12 foot long, it's got a four inch pipe on it and four inch pipe in the ground, so it's good and sturdy. I put down rubber mats so that as they move around, we don't create holes, and as they dig, it don't create holes. Now, uh, tying them up is an excellent, excellent way to get them to start paying attention to the rope halter. So you take a rope halter, you adjust it so that it fits, and then when the meal goes to the right, 
the knot bumps them, goes to the left, the knot bumps them, uh, they pull back, they feel the pressure back here. So it's a good way to teach them to stand still and quiet. Uh, will they will they blow up? Yes. Will they even blow up and fall? Yes. And I've even seen uh, halters break and uh, they fall and flip over backwards. I've seen that too. But folks, don't run in there and try to save them. I've got chains welded to my pipe with good heavy snaps. And I use a good rope halter and I tie them and I let them stand. Do not use a nylon rope halter. Nylon rope halters with those metal uh, parts up by the cheeks. I have seen animals that needed a lot of stitches and this sort of thing from those metal halters. Uh, I mean, uh, nylon halter with a metal on them. And I've seen a lot of halter pullers pull back and break those halters and break snaps. So if you put a snap on there, you're going to put a good heavy one. Now, let's just do this. Let's, I'm, I'm at the hitching rail. But now let's, let's don't go to the hitching rail. Let's go back. Let's put a surf single on them. Let's put the rope halter on them. Let's put them out in the round pin. And let's let them start respecting the halter. The big problem with the majority of mules and donkeys and even horses out there, they have no respect for that, for that halter because it's not adjusted to mean something to them. It has to make them uncomfortable. You know, there you go. Absolutely. So let me ask you this. I'm going to put a link to, um, do you remember the couple that came out about three years ago? Um, she had her mule. He had his. Um, she was really great on her timing. He really had to work on his timing. And we did that video establishing leadership. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Yep. One of the things that we started off, I'll put a link to the playlist. It's, it's like 14 videos, y'all. Um, really good stuff, all free. Um, one of the things that you do in the video is you go to put the, the rope halter on or the come along. It's, it's one or the other. And you're standing uh, the left side. Is that the near side? That's the near side. Okay, so there's, you're standing on the near side, and you go, you pull, you put your hand up on the, the back of the neck, uh, other side of the ear, and um, other side of the face, I think, and you kind of pull down, and you just leave your hands there. And so the nose is right here, so I'm going to get my hands up here so far, everyone can see. So the nose is right here, and you just hold your hands right there. <laughs> the second that that mule moves his, his face, you just tap the nose, tap, tap kind of the side of the face, and the mule moves right back. When he goes to move again, you just tap it right back. Is that type of an exercise right there? What I took that to mean when we were, when we were doing it was you were doing some halter training right there and say, hey, I want your head right here. If you're going to move it, you're going to get your nose tapped. And you weren't. Yep. I mean, guys, it, when Steve was doing it, you'll see it in the video, it was just like this. I, I mean, it wasn't hardly any pressure at all. Is that what you were trying to do in that section? Exactly. Exactly. See, and that's the very beginnings of halter training. Here's, and that's with your hands, folks. You don't put a halter on with their head up in the air or with their head over here to the right. You put a halter on with their head down, nose to the left. Now, when their head is down, they're being submissive. They loosen all five neck muscles. So it's not just a matter of head being down. The head is down and showing submission. When they got their head down like that, the, the monsters, the lions can eat them. They got to be up where they can see. So they're being submissive, being down. So they're trusting you. And then when you tip them to the left, that's using the left brain thinking about you, what you're doing. And the idea here with your hands is you're just making them un uncomfortable enough that they want to take your hands off of their head. So... When I've got my right hand just behind the pole, my, my left hand touching on the nose, as soon as they drop their head down a little bit, I take my hands off, put my hands back on. Then they do it again. I take my hands off, put my hands back on. You'll see that eventually, you'll see in the video, that the mule will just keep his head over here because he don't want to be uncomfortable with you touching his head. And that's really important. So when you do that, now you're starting to build a foundation. Now, when you put the halter on, always put the halter on, always put the bridle on with the head down, nose tip to the left. You'll, you'll have an awesome meal. So I, I put a link to the entire playlist in the comment section on both YouTube and Facebook. 
I went in and video number six is where what you're doing is you're actually, we're getting ready to do some uh, work with the come along rope. And so you are going to take off the rope halter, but in the process of doing that, you do what we were just talking about. You do that instruction uh, prior to putting on the come along rope. And so I'll put a link, another link in the comment section. So when folks, when you click that, you'll go to this particular video that we're talking about. Well, watch all of them. They're all fantastic and they're all just um, very easy for you to watch and then go apply. It's not something that really takes a whole lot of rocket science. There may be some nuances. And so that's why you've got Steve's number, 602-999-6853. So if there's some nuances that you don't quite get, give Steve a holler or yep. send him a text message, uh, or better yet, get a vid get someone to video you doing the halter work, doing the foundation work, and then send it to Steve. Steve will tell you exactly what you're doing right and to keep doing right. and exactly yep. what you need to change so that you get the results that you're looking for. But I'm going to put a second link in the comments section here uh, so you all can see that. But before I do, I want to make sure that we welcome uh, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer is watching, uh, let's see, from Long Island, New York. And uh, she says pros and cons of owning horses versus mules. So uh, we get this one from time to time. So yeah. uh, what do you got to say there? This is, a, this is a good time to bring this one back up, Steve. Well, you know, the thing about a mule is, number one, they are taking care of themselves. And I mean it like this. The donkey side, it doesn't have the flight and fright as much as the horse side that tends to want to buck and run off. Uh, the the mules, uh, I feel, are a better, better riding animal. They're much more lateral when they're walking, so they walk very, very smoothly, up hills, down hills. And folks, you don't need to have a gated animal to, to have a nice clean ride because mules are very uh, uh, single foot oriented. So when they walk, they've got a really nice little walk about them. Um, you, you uh, temperament wise, they, a lot of them have really got, well, you know, uh, there's always going to be a bad mule, bad donkey, bad horse, but they really got some decent temperaments. And it doesn't always mean breed. It's going to be a particular breed. It's going to be a, a particularly good uh, disposition or temperament. Uh, you just have to find a mule that matches you. Pros and cons, oh my goodness, I can go over and over and over again. Thing about when you're when you're get getting yourself a trail horse, trail mule, you want to have one that is not uh, bred kind of like what we a lot of people buy a quarter type mule. And it's got a real high hip, so it's really hard to ride one of those, a downhill hip on uh, on a on trails. So uh, uh, you, you want to consider the type of meal um, for the type of work that you're going to be doing. That's good. Um, now, something that I'm going to bring up real quick, because I remember us talking about this, gosh, probably six months, maybe a year ago. Uh, we, had a, we had a concern that, if I'm remembering correctly, there was a... a a lady, she had a mule, and she just had a concern that this mule just flat out didn't like her. Mm. And um, and I remember you, based upon the criteria that she shared with us, I remember you saying, yeah, sometimes, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, so just to be clear, I'm not saying this is what you said, I'm saying this is what I remember. Sure. Sometimes they've made a decision about you, and there's that's just who they are and what they're going to do, and there's nothing you can do about it. Am I remembering that correctly? Yep. Oh, yes. Yeah, there's there's times. That's why I tell folks, don't just buy the mule and hit, have it shipped to you. That can just be horrible. Even though the guy that's shipping to you says, hey, if you don't like this one, I'll send you another. Well, that's a lot of trips back and forth across the United States. You've got to spend time with that mule and uh, not just one or two uh, hours, but you need to spend a couple of days getting to know the mule. That's one of the good things about uh, Eric Palmer. Uh, he would tell you, by golly, if you're going to get my mule, you've got to spend time with me. Otherwise, I don't want you to have my mule. You know, yeah. I want to make sure the mule likes you. Uh, same thing with, uh, with old Jimmy uh, over in uh, Louisiana. 
Uh, Jimmy doesn't sell mules, but he does have a few once in a while. He's mainly in construction, but he likes messing with them. But he won't just sell you a mule unless you come spend time with him, you know. So you got to spend time with these mules, folks, to, to make sure they're going to like you, spend yeah. time with you, like being yeah. with you. And, uh, and the other thing, which is, well, I think we've already talked about it today, but the other thing is when you go, you spend an hour with a mule, you know, the, the owner, you know, not, that, not that anyone's trying to mislead or deceive or anything like that. That's not what we're saying. We're just saying, here's how it happens. The owner comes out, shows you what the mule can do, shows you that the mule can ride this way and that way, shows you that the mule can, you know, turn this way, turn that way, back this way, back that way, uh, go up into the trailer, come out of the trailer, and you think, hey, I got myself a trained mule. Well, what I've heard you say, Steve, is that was that trainer at that place with yep. that relationship with that mule. It doesn't mean that that's going to translate to what you're doing. That doesn't mean it's a trained mule. It means that mule was trained to do a couple things, but it doesn't mean it, it's going to carry over. So it's it's not just spending time to make sure that the mule likes you, but in addition to that, it's spending time to make sure the mule is what you think it is, correct? Correct. I mean, it's there's no such thing as bomb-proof mule, child-proof, Traffic proof, yada yada. It's impossible for them to be to to not have the nature flight and fright. And 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 I've used this analogy many a time. I've gone to these shows, uh, at these clinics, and I've used my own mule. And I've showed folks. I did some demonstrations, and I said, "This is the way. This this is how it goes." You see the mule doing everything, and everybody, whoa, that's a trained mule. Well, then I asked the audience, who in here can, you know, he's been riding 15 years and hands flap everywhere. So I choose a person, say, climb on this mule and show us, you know, everything I just showed you. And you know what? 15 minutes later, Dave, and it was inevitable. I never got anyone in all the years that I took and took and had him climb on my mule, never got anyone to climb on that mule and do it where the mule did it 100%. They had always made major mistakes, and the mule was going like, I'm trying, but I don't understand. And they would say, the mule won't. Yeah. I say, well, it won't, really. Well, give him to me. I climb back on, and the mule does. You know? And so it's, it's, it's like languages. If you don't understand the language, then you're not going to understand what to do. And that's what people are doing. You can't buy a mule and think, by golly, he's trained. He probably is trained, but now we got to train you. Yep, there we go. Uh, okay, so real quick follow-up from Linda. We were talking about uh, tying up with the rope halter, and Linda's concern is, will the mule hurt themselves if they're tied up like that? There is a possibility, Linda, but if you do your homework first where the mule respects the halter, yeah. uh, then you know you should be just fine. I have seen over the years when the nylon halter first started coming in about 40 years ago, uh, I got a, I bought a couple of them. And the old cowboy looked at me and says, what are you going to do with them? And I said, well, I don't have to tie any more rope halters. He says, yeah, you will, because them things are going to be nothing but trouble. And then we start seeing uh, people calling me. They had halter breakers, we called them. And sure enough, they'd show me a nylon halter, big stout one, busted, you know, uh, uh, or the snaps broke or something like that. And we started calling them halter pullers. So we started devising all kinds of ways. Listen. These animals can hurt themselves uh, all kinds of ways. I had an old veterinarian tell me, Bill Laurence one time, say, you can put a mattress on them and they'll still commit suicide. You know, <laughs> it's, they, it's just plumb the way they are. I mean, yeah. will they hurt themselves? Yes, they will. You know, absolutely. Uh, but there's that possibility. But they also can hurt themselves uh, is when, when you put the bid in wrong. Or they can hurt themselves when you tighten the cinches incorrect. Or they can hurt themselves when you're trying to load them into a trailer incorrect. And I can keep on and keep on and on. There's not a thing that you can do with that mule, that horse, that donkey, that if something happens, they don't blow up and you and end up getting themselves hurt or you. I think it's just the, uh, it's just the uh, what do you call the risk that the, comes with being alive getting yeah. hurt so it is it is related it's it's a little bit you know, it's off <coughs> well, we, off the subject but it's related yeah. so i have a friend steve he spent probably 16 years doing gymnat high 
high performance, high competition um, gymnastics. And he did just about every move uh, you could imagine. And so he wound up retiring when he was around 18, 19 years old. Never got hurt. Never had any major damage. Nothing. Me and him were hanging out on the basketball court, sitting off to the side, watching you know, some of our friends from college play. And he says, I'm going to see if I can touch the rim. He runs all the way out, gets a running start, jumps up, comes down, tears his ACL. All oh. of that time, working in gymnastics, doing all of those crazy moves that they do, no major yeah. injury, just goofing off. He's a safe person, just goofing off, hanging out, comes down, blows out his ACL. It just happens. It's like yeah. it, it's the liability of being alive, right? Yeah, and I yeah, and I you know I've seen these animals. You know if if I can ever tell you that I've been on a safe animal, it's definitely been the mule, without a doubt. I have had l- way less accidents and this sort of thing problems with the mule but they are still an equine like the mule i was riding in may uh sound mule 23 years old seen dogs seen cattle seen rattlesnakes you name it you know pretty solid old mule but i'm riding along on this solid old mule all of a sudden my puppy runs by the mule blows up and sees my puppy and gets scared kicks at my puppy fortunately missed but (coughs) When he jumped up, I had a thousand pounds hit me between the legs. And I tell you what, I spent the next four months really trying to trying to get myself back together. And that was a well trained old solid mule. I mean, yeah. they these accidents can happen, you know. And, and I, I heard Chuck Swindoll say today <laughs> that uh, you know life is tough, and uh, you, there's always a possibility of getting yourself hurt, you know, mentally yeah. and physically. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, let's see here. We got a we got a message here coming in from um, uh, John Gibson. It says Steve, we have had a great fall hunting with our four mules. That sounds like fun. Uh, just finished with our elk hunt. Meat in the freezer for the winter. I noticed Margie, the mule I'm trying to make my lead mule, continues to have confidence issues. She will lead for a while, three miles or so. Then she picks up a scent, bear or llama, and decides she wants to put other lead mule Bam to lead. Um, yeah. When leaving camp as the mule as the lead mule without Bam, she struggles with being the lead of the string. Just two mules in tow. Any thoughts on how to get her to be a strong, stronger lead mule? No, there's there's not really. I mean, when you have one that that uh, has concerns about what's going on out there, like you know, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, you know, they're they're out there. And they they just don't have the natural confidence, so it's going to have to be you, the the leader, to make it uh, comfortable and uncomfortable. So when you feel her sucking back, and she kind of likes to have the other mule be the leader, use your spurs, right, left, right, left. And when you use those spurs, right, left, right, left, you know, and 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 using your calf first, then your heel, then your spur, it makes a big difference. But uh, mules, you got to remember, they prefer leadership to be the horse. They prefer to follow a leader. And that's why I tell you time and time again, you have to be the leader. Uh, don't just have somebody cross the creek and then you follow them because they'll naturally do that. You have to say we're crossing the creek, not not following one horse after the other. So you've got to be the herd leader. She, she That's her nature. Uh, is to to be a little concerned about things. Uh, it's got its adva- advantages and disadvantages. But I can also tell you, like at the uh, at Yosemite, when I was packing freight there, uh, I I was riding a pretty solid old gelding, leading five mules behind me. This gelding had but two of its former uh, packers off, and I was trying to get him trained up and going down the trail. But anyway, he's going down the trail and a bear comes down the hill and stops and looks over his shoulder. Now, these mules and horses have seen bear after bear after bear after bear. So they hesitated at first, and I went ahead and gave my legs on this horse to get him to go forward. Well, the bear started moving on, but all of a sudden the bear turned around and started coming right to me. All right? So now what did I do? I used my legs and my spurs to get the the horse to keep going forward, forward motion, you know, and and I was able to get the bear to run off. I hooted and hollered to bear, hey, 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 get out of here, 
and use my legs on my horse to go forward, we did just fine. You know, uh, these animals, I've, I've, same thing at the, at the Grand Canyon, people after people on the ground, you'll have some mules that just loves everybody and you'll have other mules that thinks every other one is a monster, you know. Uh, so you brought it up just now. Let's talk about it a little bit. Boots, spurs. Uh, a yeah. lot of people think, Steve, that um, that that spurs are are cruel. That spurs um, they're they're the old ways. Um, you don't need them anymore. They're you got to be nicer to the animals. You you know you you talk sweetly to them and they'll start to form a relationship with you and then they'll just know your voice and do what you wanted to say and you don't need the spurs. Um, lots of different opinions. Let's talk a little bit about that. What, what are some guiding principles and some thoughts of what you've experienced that's worked when it comes to boots and spurs? Yeah. Okay, folks. Number one, you are the herd leader. Ask, tell the man. Remember the mare? She pins her ears. She asks you not to come no closer. She pins her ears and she switches her tail and she tells you not to come any closer than she spins and kicks, she demands. So there is pain involved in, in doing what the herd leader says. So I am going down the trail and my mule says, I don't want to go forward. And so I will squeeze with my calf. I'll use my calves and squeeze right, left, not both at the same time, right brain, left brain. Now, when they start to go forward, I don't have to use my spur. I use my calf. So I ask with my calf. And let's just say, okay, he says, I don't want to go forward. So I ask with my calf. Now I tell with the side of my stirrups. And uh, no, nope, I don't want to go forward. All right. So I ask. I've told now I'm going to demand. And I take my spur and I just touch him a little bit with him. I'm not talking about harpooning, folks. If you want to get bucked off, harpoon him and you're done. Okay. But... But I'm not, you, you got to ask, tell, demand. I can't tell you how many people that I've seen with spurs go directly to the spur. And pretty soon the mule is, is what we call dead sided. In other words, you can flag them with all the spurs you want. Uh, matter of fact, I've, I've trained a lot of mules that won't go forward. Even if you spur them to death, they run backwards and you run right through it simply because People did not use their legs correctly. It's like using the halter. The lady was worried about, is the possibility of getting himself hurt? Yes, but just do your homework first. Take the, take the mule and put him out on a hot, on a uh, surf single in a round pin with the halter on him and get him used to doing the halter, all right? Now let's go back with the spur. We've got the come along rope with, uh, with my left hand. We take and we use my palm and my hand We've got this on some videos that I've shot before, Dave. Uh, we've done some clinics where I use the palm of my hand to ask, and they don't move. So I, I'll give them a harder smack and tail, and, I'll, and then I'll demand with my thumb or even my spur, you know, and so they get used to it. And then you're on the ground. They understand then, ask, tell, demand. And, and they go with it. That's the thing about a mule is they'll brace into pressure. Uh, that's what makes them so good about being in the mountains. They brace into the mountain to go. But we've got to use spurs. And, folks, there are so many different spurs, uh, just like boots and this sort of thing. So let's talk just a little bit about spurs, huh, Dave? Let's do it. All right. Now, this is a, this is a custom-made spur. Uh, this has a rasp for the base. And... Uh, uh, this is a custom-made spur out of uh, Montana. You can see I've got my three crosses here. Makes a really nice little... Mm -hmm. and, and, and some silver here, too. And what's called jingle bobs. So as the spur goes... Can you hear that ring once in a oh, while? Oh, yeah. Coming through as loud you're and walking, clear. As you're walking... You can hear ching, 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 ching. And, and then this chain comes underneath uh, to keep the spur from bouncing up off the heel. Now, I can tell you that really you don't need the chain, uh, but it happens to be one of the old ways that it was designed. 
Now notice the rowel that's on here. And notice how short the shank is. The shank is real small. This is the shank here. And notice how it's kind of, it kind of moves up and then straight back. Now what that's for is if say your, your legs are a little bit longer than the mule's belly, this brings it up a little bit so that you can bump them. And that's kind of like this spur here. This is one of, this is one of my boots right here. And we're going to talk about boots. But do you see the shank on it? Mm -hmm. That's significantly uh, different. Yeah, way different. And let's just say the mule <coughs> is, uh, is fairly thin uh, in, in width. And so I, 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 and when I wrap my legs around to spur, I can hit him a lot different than I can with a fat mule where I'm going to use the smaller neck. You see the difference there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, this right here uh, is called a lady leg spur, and it comes up. It's a little bit more radical. This one doesn't come up as much. You can see how it just, this part right here kind of yeah. comes up a little bit. Okay. And this one here comes a lot more radical, comes up. So I can go up and catch, and it's got a different type of row so that uh, I, can, I can just simply take my row and roll up the mule's belly, and he'll respond and move like he should. Now, I had these made. You can see my initials here. This, it's pretty. They're, they're, this, this is supposed to be silver. Can you see the SE? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great. Right there. I had these made when I won the world championships. When I set that world record, I had Garcia make these spurs for me. So these are about 30-some years old. Now, I want you to notice, folks, the, the, the heel is a walking heel. But notice it has a place right here that comes up so that you can lock into your spur. The idea of your boot and your heel is so that your heels are down, your, your toes are up, and then your spur, I mean your heel, locks into your stirrup right there, like that. That's what you want. Now, that's that particular uh, spur. And then this one here is a custom-made spur. Uh, you can see, you'll see here. Oh, there it is. This one here is a custom made spur. You notice it's got a mule head on it. That's cool. Right there. And then it's silver. And then it's got the, the row that you can roll right up their side. Now, this was made by a, a very dear friend of mine who just passed away. He had Parkinson's and he built these spurs for me about 25 years ago. And, um, and we did some trade. I kind of got him into mules. And so he said, uh, he said, call your insurance company and get him insured. I said, really? Because you see, he was world famous for his spurs and knives. Mm. And he, he said, have him insure these spurs for $3,500. Wow. Yeah. So they just hang on my regular boots. You know, they, my spurs stay on my boots all the time. You know, I've got different spurs for, for different mules that I'm riding, different things. But this is probably my my one that I use the most, and it's a it's kind of comes straight back and up a little bit. But that's a and that's a square toed. I'm I'm not really sure that I like a square toed boot yet. You know, it's uh, I still like the old pointy ones. And then these boots, Dave, these boots I had made back when I won that World Championships, and you can see all of my mules were stock and legged. How about you that? See this? This is the back of the mule with the pack outfit. All of my mules were black with stock and leg. And then you can see the cactus on them in the mountains. And then you can see the front of the mule right here. It's like how cool. All custom made boot. Now, I want you to also notice how it has the underslung heel. How the heel comes under. And then I've got a deeper place here to stick my uh, foot into the stirrup. This was back when I was riding oxbows a lot because stuff would buck and you could say an oxbow is better. But the good part about this whole thing, notice right here. Can you read that? Uh, it's a little, oh, it's a little difficult. It says Jesus and over here says. Oh, there saves. it is. We see that. We can see that. Yep. Jesus saves. And I used to put my pants inside these boots. And uh, then I wore chinks, and then at the World Championships, I would come riding in, and uh, 
I wore them boots, and and uh, they were they were they were about how one of the ways everybody knew me doing awesome. that. But folks, we got to have spurs. Spurs are are not an evil thing. <coughs> they're 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 part of the demand stage. And if you do your groundwork first, always, always, always do your groundwork first. Uh, but is there a possibility of you getting hurt? Yep. Is there a possibility of the meal getting hurt? Yep. You know, uh, that's that's part of this world that we live in. Is there's always a possibility of of getting somebody getting scratched. You know. Yep. Uh, man, during that we've had a uh, we've had a few more folks come in and hang out with us. Uh, we have Sherry watching from Pensacola, Florida. Weather is finally getting cooler here in the South for riding, uh, so we're glad she's here. Uh, we've got Bill saying, uh, "Shared to Mules of Ohio, thanks for the information. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate that, Bill, putting that in front of the Mules of Ohio." Uh, let's see, uh, Linda is welcoming Rosalie Hine. You will have fun here. So Rosalie, if you, uh, hopped over and took up Linda's invitation, we're glad that you're here hanging out. Luke is watching, uh, Luke Streeter from Dundee, Luke. Michigan, watching, yes. saying, hi, Steve and Dave. Luke, it's good to see you. Uh, David Pingelli saying, coming through loud and clear, clear on the ship in Nova Scotia. He is a traveler. He is yeah. all over the place. Yeah, he's a musician. He now he has good coffee, drives a nice 32 or is a 30, 36 Ford, uh, but he has awful good coffee. Nice, nice, nice. I'll have to put a link in the comments section for people to get their fix. Uh, we've got uh, Linda saying, gorgeous boots and spurs collection. Fascinating to see the differences and the reason for the differences. I agree, Linda. Uh, something that I've never really known much about, so it's fun to learn. Uh, Dan Davis from Augustine, Texas, put my granddaughters on my two mules this past weekend. Would have never thought it would have ever happened when I first started, but come along rope really works. That's a theme we're hearing, isn't it, Steve? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yay, come along rope. A little bit more of that every single time. Okay, Linda has another question. She says, just ignore me if I have too many questions. Linda, we would never ignore you. No My mule, Theo, is missing an eye on the left. He was born that way. He is not shy on the blind side, and his trainer, owner, told me, just act like he can see you on that side, and he'll do fine. But would you change any of your left brain, right brain methods for a mule who is blind on the left? No, not really. Not really. They'll, they'll still get a hold of it. You still... Want to think about going right, left, right, left with your hands when they're not doing correctly. But uh, we had a mule at the Grand Canyon that was down at Phantom that was blind in one eye. And he did just fine. Very good. Uh, so, uh, so, folks, we've got about seven minutes left here. And if you have not said hello yet, we would love to say hello to you. So put your name and where you're watching from in the comments section. Uh, like I said, want to say hi to you. Make sure that uh, we know that you're here and make sure that you know we see you. Uh, if you have any final questions, uh, we have time for one or two more. Put that in the comments section below. Uh, even if we have answered it in a past broadcast and you want us to go ahead and answer it again, that's fine. Uh, if it's a question about a horse, go ahead and put that in there. That's fine too. It's, uh, it's, it's really all about making sure you get the information you need so that you can take those steps forward in that relationship with the animal and just experience a lot of joy uh, being a, an equine owner, an equine trainer, an equine rider. Um, and then uh, if there's anybody who you think would really benefit from what we talked about today, just put their name in the comment section, tag them, or send them a link via email. Uh, that's just one of the ways that we get more and more people in, uh, into the community here of mules uh, and donkey owners because there's not a whole lot of really strong communities out there uh, for mules and donkeys. Plenty for horses, plenty and plenty, plenty for horses, all the different types, but mules and donkeys, uh, we're really doing what we can to make sure that everyone has a resource here. Uh, let's see, Linda says thank you. So Linda, we're really, uh, really grateful that you took some time to uh, uh, ask that question. Uh, Matthew's watching from Georgia. Good to have you here, Matthew. Thank you so much. David Walls is watching from Kentucky, so it's good to have you here, David. And you know what I didn't think about, Steve? We put it we put it in the uh, email that we sent out the the time, but I did not think about the time zone change. And I'm betting we're going to have some friends hopping on here in the next couple minutes, thinking, "Wait, did I miss it? Did the time change?" And yeah. uh, and so I, I don't know if a lot of folks know, but out here in Arizona. Uh, 
we don't have uh, daylight savings time. We're just mountain standard time all the time. And so everybody will roll their clocks forward. When we stay the same, everybody will roll their clocks back. And we stay the same. So I, I kind of like it, but it does make for a little bit of a confusion. Uh, Vicki Jones is watching. She says, love the hat. Yeah, Steve. The, <laughs> the original all-terrain vehicle. Folks, if you want one of those, where do they get them, Steve? Well, they have to get a hold of Eric over at uh, Mountain Ridge Gear. That's right. And uh, he sells them over there, and he's got all kinds of colors, all kinds of ways. And he's he's got some pretty awesome hats, camouflage, you name it. He's got a bunch of them. You know what? Uh, Eric was with us about three weeks ago, and it was fun having him on. How's he doing, Steve? Have you talked to him recently? Yeah, I just talked to him today. He was the one telling me about my friend, and I... I'll bring that up again shortly about him getting bucked off and stuff. But he was up uh, elk hunting and uh, didn't do any good. And uh, they already got one elk anyway, but he thought maybe he'd try it again. And just got back uh, last night and got so many pack saddles to send out. So that's what he's doing. Very good. Um, I'm going to put a link. Here is our show with Eric Glenn. I'm going to put a link out there. Y'all should watch it. It's pretty good. Uh, okay. Jennifer has another question. Says, Jennifer uh, was leading my horse on the right side. He was behind me. Uh, he slipped both feet uh, slipped down the rain drain. Is it o is okay because legs were wrapped? Would a mule have seen, would ha a mule have seen that rain drain? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you bet. They. That's one thing we see at... Uh, when I used to do some parades and stuff, my six mules, when they seen a drain coming, they would move out of the way. And then you get the ones that has the bars in them. Boy, them mules, they know they know whether what's going on. You betcha, they'd have seen it for sure. Uh, that's there. I mean, there's a reason why they use mules and donkeys going up and down the Grand Canyon, because uh, yep. they they are incredibly intense. If you haven't ridden a mule, and I'm not talking from a lot of experience, but I have one experience that really sticks out to me um, is uh, is if you haven't ridden a mule, uh, it, it's a little bit of, a, of an odd sensation when you go to watch them put their feet where they need to go. Steve and I were riding. It was the first time I'd ever ridden a mule, and it, I was riding Stacy. What mule were you riding, Steve? Was Pearl still around then? Um, I might have been riding Pearl. I don't know. I, I ride so many different mules when I was... <laughs> You know, younger, I can't remember half of them now. Uh, well, because I'm we always were riding training. in your backyard. Yeah. We were riding in your backyard and uh, yeah. came across kind of like a, uh, a riverbed type thing. And uh, Steve went across and Stacy comes up and I'm holding on the reins. And of course, Stacy's just, she's great mule. She's just doing everything the right way and going. And I kind of look, I'm like, Steve, I don't know. He goes, just let go and she'll take care of it. And she did. Just one yeah. foot and looking where she's going. Just yep. very methodical, Dressed seeing everything, comes right back up. I was like, well, that was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be, or at least a lot easier to ride on than yep. I thought it was going to be. It was, it was a pretty cool pretty cool moment. Um, let me see here. I think that's it for this week, Steve. Did you have anything else that you that? wanted to share? No, just when you're all buying boots, uh, buy boots where that you the, a, a size bigger so that you can quickly kick them off. I usually do demonstrations at clinics to where I've got my boot on, mm -hmm. and I show folks how quickly I can just, I can lock it with my left foot, mm -hmm. and just as if it's hung up in a stirrup, and I can, it'll come off really quick. Uh, so you always want to have boots a lot looser than uh, than you do your shoes. And you want to ride with the tapaderos too. Absolutely, if you want to ride the safest, ride with taps. And I think I heard you say. Uh, you, you'll ride them even with boots, but um, especially if you're riding without that gap in the raised heel, you want the tapadero because your whole foot, you're not locking into the stirrups and the whole foot could go right through and now you're caught up. And yep. uh, that's, that's the way you get yourself in the ER. Yeah, I was just talking to a, a cowboy last night saying how one of his friends uh, got his uh, spur hung up in his britching and fell off backwards. Hmm. And Fortunately for him, it was a quiet mule. Otherwise, that mule could have kicked him to death, you know. Yeah, very good. All right, Thanks. well, 
Folks, right. that's it. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, to all of our friends who may just now be popping on, uh, the time zone change did happen. We still broadcast 2.30 Mountain Standard Time. And so, uh, so we'll be back here next week, 2.30 Mountain Standard Time, broadcasting and uh, talking mules and donkeys. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone for hanging out. And, yep. yeah, we'll see you next week. If you need anything, muleranch.com. Find yep. everything uh, Steve's got there for sale as well as awesome, awesome training material. Uh, great majority of it is free. And, uh, of course, you can always send a message to 602-999-6853. Phone number's on the website. Send a text message, pictures, and Steve will get right back to you. Steve, take care. Yep. We'll see you next week. All right. Hey, Jess, you say goodbye. Jess. 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 Bye. Say, say. <laughs> There's Jess right there. Yeah, there he is. Hey, Jess. All right. He's a good boy. Very good. All right, Steve. We'll see you next week. We'll see you next week, everyone. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.